Deuteronomy chapter 13, Luke 8, excuse me, Mark 8, Luke 18, uh, Deuteronomy uh, 13. Let's start in prayer. Uh, Father, we, we thank you for bringing us here. Lord, I pray that you give me your spirit this morning as I preach so that uh, what I say will be uh, clear, understandable, and true. Um, I pray that you open my heart and the hearts of all of us here to receive your word um, and to live our lives accordingly. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so the gospel this morning, uh, the story that we had this morning, very short, uh, represents the final conflict between the Pharisees of, of uh, Galilee Matthew tells us that there were Sadducees there too, but let's just focus on the Pharisees because that's what Mark gives us. Uh, the Pharisees of Galilee and, and Jesus. So before we dive into the text, what I'd like to do is, uh, is summarize um, the conflict as it is um, and, and what is leading up to this text. Because if you just read this text out of nowhere, it seems very uh, mean of Jesus not to give these poor guys a sign. They're just asking for some demonstration of who he is, and then he doesn't give it. So let's back up a little bit and talk about how we got here. Now, we have been, and we have seen Jesus taking the twelve on a tour of Gentile, of Gentile lands. The twelve have seen, in the Decapolis and in Tyre and in Sidon, they have seen, though not digested, that Jesus' call to repent and believe is a call both to Jew and to Gentile. There's no partiality. That's been the message that Jesus has wanted to convey to the disciples. There's no partiality. The Jew stands guilty and the Gentile stands guilty of sin. All humanity together stands in need of rescue from the power of and the consequence of sin. And Jesus offers that rescue to everybody. He sends that call out to all. Now, many Gentiles have seemed open to that message, and we can assume, based on what we've read, that many have actually received that message and received Jesus. Many have. Um, and Within, within those Gentile areas and within the Jewish areas, about 12 have. That's it. That's what Jesus has in the Jewish area. Now, we shouldn't think, and it's a, it's a temptation to think, uh, reading through Mark, maybe not for us, but I know it was a temptation for people reading Mark um, about 50 years ago, to think that this means the Gentiles are inherently better in some ways um, than the Jews, because they're getting it, um, and the Jews aren't. Those uh, stupid Jews, why aren't they getting it? We don't want to go there. We don't want to go there. Um, I'll tell you why. The, the, that I believe, and, and that you believe in Jesus, and your neighbor doesn't, or my neighbor doesn't, says nothing about me, right? Says nothing about me. My faith, that faith that I have in Jesus, didn't originate with me, so I can't take any credit for it. Right? John writes in a passage we've read many times out before, in John chapter 6, verse 44, No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. So, I'm in Christ and you're in Christ because... The Father has drawn you to Christ, not because you or I are just special that way. Um, and Paul writes much the same thing in a passage we actually looked at a couple of weeks ago when he writes in Ephesians 2, verse 8, By grace you have been saved through faith, and this, both the grace part and the faith part, this is not your own doing. It is a gift from God. And the, he sums that up so that no one can boast, which is something we're all prone to, I think, so that no one can boast. So there's nothing special about the Gentiles that sets them apart from the Jews. Nothing. The point, however, that Jesus has made is God is willing, disciples, hear me, God is willing to draw Gentiles to himself. He is willing to make even the Gentiles part of his family. That's what he's been trying to tell um, the twelve. 
think it through. Um, the faith through which God uh, saves sinners, as we just read, is a gift from God. So, if Gentiles are found with that faith, it necessarily means that God's mercy extends beyond Israel. That He's had mercy on those who have come. That's why they've come. Because He's uh, had, had mercy. Now, what made this so difficult? Like, this is why the disciples didn't get it. What made it so difficult um, for the disciples? What made it so the substance of Jesus' preaching so offensive to the Pharisees is this very idea that underlies this lesson that Jesus has been trying to teach through the Twelve, this, uh, this very idea of grace, an unmerited gift blessing from God. That's a very difficult concept for the Twelve. It's a very difficult concept um, for um, the Jews in Galilee, and especially uh, for the Pharisees, that their own membership in God's kingdom is a gift received by surrender and not a reward earned by human merit was an idea they rejected over and over and over again. Now, that's not to say, we've got to be very clear, I don't want to misrepresent them. That's not to say they had no concept of grace. Go ahead and turn to your second marker in Luke chapter 18, verses 11 through 12, and we'll see they do have some concept of God's grace, God's uh, mercy on them. This is a Pharisee. So this is a parable that Jesus is telling about a Pharisee and a tax collector. You're probably familiar with the parable. And if you remember, the Pharisee goes to the front of the temple, I guess, or where as close as he can get anyway without being struck down or whatever. Um, he goes to the front of the temple, he lifts up his hands, and he looks up into heaven, and he says in verses 11 and 12, um, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week. I get tithes of all I get. Right? Okay, now, there is something good about this prayer. Can anyone identify the good part of this prayer? Anyone see it? No one? He's thanking God, right? He's, he's thanking God for the good stuff that he does. That's good. That's correct. That's right. The Pharisee recognizes that his good works, his righteous deeds, originate with God. Good. A plus on that part of the theology exam. What's wrong? What's wrong? Notice the eyes in that. It's not the eyes seeing, the eye, capital eyes. Um, my works set me apart. Because I do these things, even though I'm in, I'm, God's given me the grace to do them, because I do them, unlike other men, like this tax collector here, my law-keeping, albeit the result of grace, but my law-keeping enables me then, therefore, on the basis of those things, to stand before God. And it disallows that of the guy. God helps me, but I do them. I do them. Now, let's look at the contrast that Jesus draws in his parable with the other guy, the tax collector. The tax collector there uh, wouldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God, uh, be merciful to me, a sinner. What is the tax collector relying upon? What's he depending upon? God's mercy, God's grace, God's the free gift of God. He's trusting that God is good and that God will have mercy on him. He's trusting on, in nothing in himself. Nothing in himself. And if you think about what Jesus has shown the disciples over the last three weeks, um, we have seen Gentile after Gentile after Gentile come begging for what? Mercy from God, right? We see that over and over again. And what does Jesus say um, to sum up his parable? You see it there in verse 14. I tell you, this man, meaning the tax collector, went down to his house. You have to go down in Jerusalem from the temple. Um, went down to his house justified. Means being, receiving the status of being righteous before God. That's what justified means. Went home justified rather than the other. So the Pharisee, um, in this story and the Pharisees that Jesus has encountered believe grace-empowered law-keeping ensures 
their place in the kingdom, Jesus says, nope, just grace. Not grace and power of law keeping, just grace. Why? We've said this before. We've said this so many times. Even Isaiah 64, 6. You can look at several other passages that are uh, through my head right now. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. God says, even the good things you do are like filthy rags in my sight. So, of course, on the basis of those things, you can't expect to be accepted, um, accepted as righteous in my sight. Now, anytime we get into this talk, and I had this question come up a couple of weeks ago. Anytime we get into this discussion of works... And their relationship to your standing before God. And we say things like, your works will not give you a standing before God. Only grace does. People say, well, then what use are they? Why do we even do them? Why does God even give them? Why does God even give a law? Does he take no pleasure um, in our, our good works at all? And we've said many times before, the first reason, of course, that he gives the law is to show you that you can't do it. To drive you to your knees in repentance and and seeking God's mercy. But, but having said that, just because your good works don't earn a place in the kingdom of God doesn't mean that God can't ever be pleased by them. This last Friday, we went out. I took my wife out for a post-Valentine's Day uh, date. Um, uh, and we, we got back, and Gwendolyn, Jerry, babysat, um, along with, uh, yeah, with six kids. That's amazing. I mean, we had to, that's a lot of, six kids, Jerry, say, raise your hand, Jerry. That, that's a, that's, that's a good work, okay? You know, if, if good works could earn heaven, Jerry would have just um, gotten into heaven on the basis of that, of that particular, anyway, we got home, and Gwendolyn was going to throw us a party while we'd been gone. She's five, if you don't know Gwendolyn, she's five. She wanted to throw us a party, kind of a surprise when we got back, and so um, she had poured us glasses of water. Um, that I think were supposed to be pretend to Kool-Aid or something. They were big, they were glasses of water. And she poured them out, and then she got a corn dog stick from a corn dog that she had just eaten, and there were still pieces of hot dog and corn dog hanging off the hot dog, the corn dog stick, and she stirred up the pretend Kool-Aid mix into the water, and then she says, here, Daddy, um, here, my and, and, you know, our hearts just kind of melted, you know. Oh, <laughs> that's so beautiful. Um, and um, we took the glass and we kind of went like, okay. <laughs> so she would think that we were drinking the water. Because it was a beautiful thing. Now, would I drink the water? No, it's, it's gross. I mean, if you handed me a cup of water with that stuff in it, I would, I'd be offended. Um, but, be <laughs> but because she's my daughter and, and I love her, I was delighted by the gift. It, it, was, it was a pleasing thing. Um, in my sight. If I went to a restaurant and a waiter did that, um, I wouldn't invite him home and say, will you be my son, right? <laughs> so, so, so when we say your, your, your works are filthy rags, this is kind of what we mean. If you're a Christian, even though your works don't give you any standing before him, he loves, he loves it when you do good things. See, it's, a, it's a pleasing thing in his sight because he loves you and you're his child. That's the whole, that's the whole point but you don't become his child on the basis of those things. Right? See the difference? Very important. Pharisees missed it. <laughs> Completely missed that. And so Jesus says to Israel, I'll do work on your behalf, and I'll bring you to my house my, on, my, on, my own, on the basis of my own work. You just surrender and trust me. You just surrender and trust me. But doing that means, as we've said before, letting go of the illusion of self-sufficiency, of the illusion that your works merit your place. And it's hard to do. It's hard to let go of that illusion. Pharisees reject Jesus, not because he's provided insufficient evidence for his identity. He's done many miracles. Not because his teachings conflict with scripture. They do not. Not because his identity is hidden, but because to accept him is to be utterly humbled. That's why. To acknowledge them to accept Jesus would be to acknowledge leading Israel wrongly for their entire lives. It would be to relinquish their authority, to give it up. To receive Jesus for the Pharisees would be to lose what they love most, 
And I'll tell you what it is for us, too, as sinners, because we love sin most of all. We love ourselves most of all. And to accept Jesus, to, to lose that love, to give that love over to the Lord and, and trust him. All right, so um, that's the problem. That's the whole issue between Jesus and the Pharisees. It's about grace um, and, and, and the Pharisees' inability to receive it. Let us not be Pharisees um, this morning. So Jesus leads us. Let's now turn to our text. So if you're in Luke 18, go ahead and turn back to Mark chapter 8. Luke, uh, Jesus leaves Galilee after a public confrontation with the Pharisees. Um, and if you remember right, Jesus kind of embarrasses them. He does such a good job of arguing that they feel embarrassed. They kind of withdraw. Um, and, um, and so the, I think they've been roiling ever since then. They've been very angry. I can't tell that for sure, but I'll, I'll show you why in a minute I think that. They've been roiling ever since. Jesus knows this, and yet after, and he's already said, I'm done with Galilee, and yet after feeding 4,000 Gentiles plus, he immediately, if you look up at verse 10, he immediately heads back to Jewish Galilee. That's where he's going. Again, his Galilean ministry is over. And so we need to ask, why is he going back there? What's his purpose going back there? He does go back there every once in a while just to do uh, one or two healings, maybe visit Peter's mother-in-law, but he doesn't do any more ministry there. So we have to ask, why is he returning at this point? And I think we'll be able to answer that as we, as we work through the passage. Um, the Pharisees, verse 11, came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Now, Jesus sends no notice of his arrival. He's been gone for months, I guess, probably. He sent no herald forward saying, hey, we're coming back to Galilee. There's no indication here in the text of a crowd gathering. So we have to ask, how do the Pharisees know he's back? They seem, anyway, from the text to meet him at the shore. We, we don't know, but they're the first people there. The cr crowd's not there. So it could be that they posted lookouts. It could be that they were so enraged by what he'd done before and the, what they believed to be false teaching that he had promoted before. They wanted to make sure that they were the first ones to meet him when he got off the boat. Um, and so they're right there. Now notice in verse 11, uh, we're told that they, uh, they argue, debate, quote, unquote, with him. Now the Greek indicates that Jesus argued back. This was a... Uh, they're arguing with him, him arguing with them, um, and it's after that that he gives, they ask him, they, they begin to test him and ask him, for, ask him for a sign. Now, my guess is that if a Christian uh, from our day were transported back in time as one of the twelve, I think there'd be a little bit more dialogue to this account. When they began to argue with Jesus and argue, Jesus began to argue back, we might hear something like, hey, guys, Guys, we all worship Yahweh, right? We're brothers. Let's not argue. Let's not argue. Let's not fight. You'll know we are Christians by our love, after all, and this is not loving. What kind of testimony are we giving? People are now looking on at us, having this argument. Come on, let's, let's, just, let's just talk about something we can, all, we can all agree on. Now, gentleness... And kindness are not optional virtues for Christians. I mean, we don't get to decide whether or not to be gentle or kind. We're called to do that. But many do, I think, confuse gentleness and kindness with a bland kind of niceness that views any argument, any engagement, any conflict any passionate contention, which Jesus does quite often, as hatred or meanness. We're very conflict-averse in our culture. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. For us, often, love means not saying anything that might upset anyone. That's love. But you have to notice, you see it here, you see it elsewhere, when the truth is at stake, Jesus not only never avoids conflict, he crosses the lake for it. He comes to get it. He goes right to it. 
His, his apostles, if you've read the book of Acts, if you read any of Paul's letters or John's letters or Peter's letters, his apostles never shy away from it either. Peter tells us, this is a command to all Christians, be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks. That's a, that's a be prepared to argue. Are you prepared for that? Be prepared to argue for the hope that lies within you. Jude says, contend for the faith. It's, there's a command there, content, be willing to fight, not fisticuffs, we're talking verbally, be willing to contend um, for the faith. That's Jude, um, he only has one chapter, so verse 3. Um, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, get this, listen to the language here. We destroy arguments. We destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Are you able to do that? That's to characterize the Christian. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, that was. Everywhere you look, conflict in defense of the faith done with gentleness and respect, of course, is a good thing. It's a good thing. Now, this is difficult for us for two reasons, and I think uh, one of those reasons is that contending for the faith requires Certainty requires us to be certain about something. I think we're conflict averse because we're certainty adverse. It's one thing to say, I believe Jesus' words, but hey, they may not be true. I don't know. Could be wrong. No one will get mad if we say that. It's another to say, Jesus' words are absolutely true, and I will die uh, before I deny that. And any other words that conflict with Jesus' words are false. That's different, isn't it? Sometimes in our world it hurts our ears to hear that kind of talk. It seems harsh. The New Testament mandate to contend for the faith demands a level of certainty that makes us uncomfortable. Are you, are you certain? Are you certain that Jesus is the truth? Are you? Are you able to contend for him? Another hurdle, the second hurdle, is that our culture categorizes faith as a matter of personal fulfillment. It's a, it's a private, personal matter. No one wants to talk about religion publicly because it's all about uh, a personal, uh, it's designed for personal um, and happiness. So people don't ask in our culture, uh, is this true? They tend to ask, is this what I'm looking for? Is this going to be good for me or not? Not, is it true? But Jesus presents himself as the truth. He says, I'm the way, uh, the only way to be rescued um, from the power of sin and its eternal consequences. And so, um, and so there's not, within the New Testament, either in Jesus' words or the apostles, any hint of backing away from a conflict when that truth is at stake. And there's a good reason for that. There's a good reason why Jesus was willing to go back over that lake and deal with these Pharisees one last time. And I'll tell you what that is. Um, when a teacher or a leader, I'm not talking about people with sincere questions and doubts. There are lots of us here who have doubts. Don't think I'm talking about you. But I'm talking about a leader or a teacher of the people of God um, proposes some other way apart from Jesus or twists the scriptures in such a way as to create another kind of Jesus or teaches something that God um, forbids, what happens is that teacher or leader leads people away from the light into the darkness. It's not just a difference of opinion. Someone following a false teacher is, lead, is being led into the darkness. And Jesus loves people, right? Doesn't he? He loves people, and so instead of avoiding the conflict, avoiding the contention, avoiding the fight, he goes right to it for the sake of those who are being led astray and for the sake of those who are leading people astray. Both. Both. Jesus rushes into the conflict motivated by his love for his sheep. That's why he came back. That's why he's here. He's going to have one final conflict in Galilee before moving to Jerusalem and fighting there, uh, having a conflict there. Um, 
So he's there for this reason. Now, the Pharisees do have a plan um, as a way of getting um, at Jesus. And they say, give us a sign from heaven. Give us a sign from heaven. Now, the Pharisees believed um, that demons could perform earthly miracles. In other words, they could heal. They could uh, 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 heal, cure blindness that wasn't blind, people being born blind. They could do certain kinds of miracles. But they believed that only Yahweh could perform heavenly miracles, like calling down fire from heaven, uh, stopping the sun from uh, in the sky. Those kinds of miracles were only things that God could do, they believed. Now, that distinction is nowhere in the Bible. You'll never find that distinction anywhere in the Bible, but it was part of their tradition, and that's what they believed. Now, who remembers who the Pharisees believed Jesus to be? What did they say? What was their verdict about Jesus in chapter 3? Who remembers? He's possessed by Satan, right? So um, they believe that all the miracles that he's doing are earthly miracles. Now, remember, they haven't seen him calm the storm. Only the disciples saw that. They didn't see him walk in the water. The disciples saw that. Um, very few people saw him raise the, the, the girl from the dead because that was up in a private room by themselves. Um, they think that he is possessed by Satan and so he can do earthly miracles, but he can't do heavenly ones. And so they think they've got him trapped because now they can put them to the test and they can say, show us a sign from heaven. And when he can't do it, he's exposed as a fraud. Or if he re re decides not to do it, he's exposed as a fraud. That's the idea there. Either way. Now we know, because we've seen, and the disciples have seen too, Jesus stop hurricanes with the word. He's walked on water. He's made bread um, from nothing. He can call down fire from heaven should he choose to. Why doesn't he? Why doesn't he here? This would be a great time to do it, right? I mean, this would really make uh, an impact on uh, the people uh, who are watching, if there are people watching this confrontation. It would make an impact on the Pharisees too, I would think. Why doesn't he do it? Well, to answer that question, let me ask another question. Do you think it's wrong for the Pharisees to test Jesus? To test his teaching? Do you think it's wrong? I see some people nodding their heads, some people shaking their heads. Um, well, I personally don't think it's wrong because the Bible says to do that. Look at, um, uh, go ahead and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 13. The Old Testament provides two tests for prophets, or for people who propose that they come from God. The first test is in Deuteronomy 18. Don't look at that one. We'll, we'll, I'll just tell you what it means. That's if, uh, if a prophet predicts something, says something is going to come to pass, it better come to pass. And he has to have a 100% track record, um, or he's not a prophet, which you know, cuts out lots of our modern-day prophets, doesn't it? I mean, Harold Camping, um, all the people, a lot of people who say they're prophets nowadays are obviously not prophets based on Deuteronomy 18. Um, but what the second... Uh, test is, does what this prophet say, or is what this prophet says, in conflict with what God has already said? We'll talk about that in a moment. But both conditions, and I want you to notice this, both tests, both measures for prophets emphasize one thing, and that one thing is that God's word is true. God's word is true. And so if God speaks through someone, what he says will come to pass. And what he says will be in line with the truth that God has already revealed. Deuteronomy 13, 1 3 gives us that second test. And uh, let's just look at verses 1 through 3. Um, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and if it comes to pass, and if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let's serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer of dreams. What does this tell us about the capacity? What does this tell us about what false prophets might be able to do? Well, they might be able to fool people how? Miracles. This text assumes that a false prophet could come and do mighty signs and wonders. You see no distinction there between earthly signs and heavenly signs. Any signs and wonders. A false prophet could come and do miracles. And do miracles. So the ultimate measure... Um, while miracles definitely validate or can validate a prophet, um, the ultimate measure is whether or not that person says what God has said, whether his words are in line with God's word, whether or not he uh, reveals or represents God as God has represented himself or uh, leads to some other constructed God through false teaching. 
even if he does miracles, even if he does miracles, if what he says is not in line with God's word, then cast him aside. So, it's never wrong to test teachers. It's never wrong for you to test me. I've never done a miracle, but it's never wrong for you to test me. If what I'm saying is not in line with God's word, test me. That's why I want your Bibles open um, while I'm preaching. But notice here, the Pharisees are not applying that Old Testament test, are they? They're not applying that test. On the one hand, they can't. They've so elevated tradition to the same level of authority as Scripture that they have therefore erased the distinction between breaking tradition and breaking Scripture so the test is wrong. They can't tell whether or not, God, whether or not Jesus is violating God's Word because they've twisted um, God's Word. On the other hand, they've decided that only God can do heavenly miracles and that's not there either. So they're not even able to do the test. So I imagine, I'm not Jesus, but I imagine Jesus is thinking something like this. One, how many miracles do you need? You've seen me do so many things that only God can do. How many miracles do you need? Two, um, miracles aren't your measure anyway. Scripture is, but you've added so much to the Bible that you can't measure me accurately. And three, no matter anyway, because your unbelief isn't because of lack of evidence, your unbelief is because you have decided not to believe. Right? So, no more signs for you. No more signs. I'm finished with the signs. Does the demand for signs sound familiar to you? Who ever asked Jesus to give a sign of his identity before? If you are really the Son of God, you can turn these rocks into bread. Amen? Now, Satan knew. Jesus' identity very well. And what Satan wanted to do was not to have some evidence of his identity, but he wanted Jesus to use his power to serve his pride rather than the Father's purpose. He wanted Jesus to say something like, oh yeah, watch this. Let me show you who I am. Right? And step outside of the Father's will. Satan wasn't seeking the truth. He wanted to destroy Jesus. Same thing here. These Guys are not seekers. They're not looking for the truth and Jesus is saying, no, I'm not going to show it to you. These guys have already decided that Jesus is not who he claims to be and they've already rejected him. And when that's true, there comes a point when evidence, signs, arguments will make no difference because a decision has been made, a heart has been hardened, an ear has been just deafened. There comes a point when that happens. God can, at that point, reach such people. It's not beyond him to do that. Of course he can. But sometimes he lets them go their way. Never stop praying for someone you think might be there. Always pray because you don't know what's in the mind of God. But sometimes God lets people go their way, have their way. That's what Jesus is doing here. That's what Jesus is doing here. Verse 12. He sighs deeply in his spirit and says, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Jesus sighed. The word there is stenos. We've talked about this before. Before healing the deaf man in chapter 7, Jesus sighed, stenos. It can be translated, it is translated elsewhere as groan, and it's, like a, it's a deep, deep uh, emotive sound out of the gut, out of, out of deep grief is what it is. Deep sadness and grief. Now here the word is actually compounded. It's anastenos, which is utter grief. Now, why is that? What, why is Jesus grown here? And the answer to that question is that Jesus loves the Pharisees. And in the face of their hardness of heart, it just it evokes in him utter grief and sadness. He doesn't relish what he's doing here. 
how Jesus has struggled with them and how, how he's longed for them to see the truth. A year from this point, overlooking Jerusalem, Jesus is going to say something very similar to this. This is in Luke 13, verse 34. Jesus is looking at Jerusalem. He knows he's about to go into the city and be betrayed and killed. And he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. You were not willing. It's another expression of anastinos. It's utter, utter grief. And so he lets them go. He sadly lets them go. With deep grief, he lets them go, but he lets them go. You might think here of the father letting the prodigal son go, half his way. He says, there will be no sign for this generation. Now the word generation, Guinea, is a, a group sharing a common origin it doesn't necessarily mean generation in the same way that we mean generation. And I think what Jesus means here is there will be no sign for you and for those who share your unbelief. My signs are not for those who have decided not to believe. And there's a reason for that. He says it in Luke chapter 16. You don't have to look here. But after he, uh, after he tells a parable, a parable about um, Lazarus um, and the rich man, Lazarus being the poor man, um, who dies and the rich man is, dies also and he's found in the place of torment and he says, oh, let me go back and tell my family because then they'll turn from their sins and trust um, in you. And Jesus said, or uh, Abraham says, you can't go back. And even if you were going to go back, um, you wouldn't, it wouldn't make a difference because they have Moses and the prophets. They have Moses and the prophets. And if they don't believe them, no miracle, not even someone rising from the dead, will make a difference. And that's what Jesus is confronting here again. No miracle will change these people's hearts, these minds. So that's it. It's a very sad passage. Verse 13, he leaves them. This is an act of judgment. He leaves them. He gets into his boat again, and he goes to the other side, and there, there we are. Very, very sad. Jesus is finished with the Pharisees of Galilee. And the sad thing, the sad thing is they're not saying no to some new law stacked on top of their shoulders. They're not saying no to some uh, horrible uh, uh, straitjacket of, of written rules or regulations. They're saying no to a man, God also, who has come to offer them Freedom, forgiveness, joy, and eternal life for free. It's very sad. It's very sad. They have only to surrender and receive freely what they're working now to earn. Okay, so my first question is, and then we're, we're wrapping up here, is do you know someone like that who just will not receive Christ? who just will not receive Christ. You're not God, so you don't know what God's decision is, whether he's going to per turn that person's heart or not. Um, but I do say, now is, in this life, is never the time to give up prayer for that person. Always keep praying. Always, even if, you, if it's gone to the point where you can't talk anymore. My dad was like that for a while. He was too, you could not persuade him. You couldn't talk to him. So my mom went to prayer, and now I can talk to him again. Pray. Add that person to your prayer, your prayers. Secondly, if you are in that place today, if you are in that place, and you've said no all your life, said no all your life to the offer, the free offer of the gospel, you do not have to be in that place anymore. You don't have to be. If you hear it today with your ears and see it with your eyes, the offer of forgiveness and eternal life is open to anyone and everyone who will turn to Jesus Christ and surrender, so you should do that today. Finally, I know most of us are Christians, um, and so uh, this might seem like it doesn't apply to us, but let me, let, me, let me just say, even if you're in Christ, you can make yourself deaf and blind. You can make yourself deaf and blind. You can shut your eyes and your ears. You cannot, when, can, when you hear a message or a word that is convicting you of a certain sin, you can shut it down and keep going in the direction you're going. 
You can always run away from home. Now, God loves you, and he's going to open your eyes, and he's going to draw you back because he's the good shepherd. But let me tell you, it's going to be a miserable process. It's going to be a miserable process. How much better simply to return to the Father's house now on your own and receive his embrace? He is willing to do that this morning for all of us, we, uh, whether you're a Christian in need of repentance or someone who has never received Christ, he is ready to embrace you today. All that is required is for you to be willing to surrender. Let's stop there. The Lord be with you.